Matt, uh, so we're having another MAM chat today. And, you know, we, we, we both believe that 2024 could be a seminal year um, and that uh, we will see a lot of unexpected events, uh, which could be anything from, from debt related to war related to, to political events. Um, and there's so much to cover, and uh, but you know our our overall theme hasn't changed, and this is about wealth preservation and, and about using gold as the best instrument for wealth preservation. And and we now think we reached a point when this is becoming absolutely critical for people uh, to look at wealth preservation. You know, when we started it at twenty five years ago, almost. Uh, Gold as a percentage of world financial assets uh, were about the same as they are today, about half a percent. So in spite of the fact that we've been standing um, since we started on the soapbox shouting about, please protect yourself, people are not doing that generally. And, and, and still in, in, the, in this century, gold is the best performing asset um, up about in dollars up, up about seven times and, you know, and many other currencies, it's it, it, like in, in Argentina, it, it's up you know, thousands of percent, and Venezuela is up thousands of tens of thousands of percent, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. But we think now, that, you know, we're getting into now, here we are on the 11th hour. Uh, and I think in the next few weeks, Matt, what we're going to do is to take uh, our audience through the, the various risk areas that we see. I mean, obviously, it all stems from debt. Uh, Remember that uh, when gold was made uh, uh, well, uh, well, or had no backing anymore, uh, or, or sorry, when the currencies had no backing anymore from gold in, in, from the 15th of August 1971, uh, debt has grown exponentially, as we know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. at, at figures here, for example, I mean, US, US debt in 1971. Uh, was 1.7 trillion total US debt, and you would know mm -hmm. what it is today 97 trillion, 1.7 trillion to 97 trillion. That's total US debt, and federal debt mm -hmm. in 71 was 400 billion. And yeah. today we're talking about uh 34 trillion, and that's the underlying reason for all of this. But but you know, we're going to take our audience through the various risk factors we see now that, uh, are, in our view, apps makes uh, wealth protection more critical than ever um, in the history of, of the world as we know it, at least. So, so the, one of these areas that is now always linked to a war, Matt, is, is um, sorry, to debt is war. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, now, of course, we are seeing wars and, and major wars um, not on a massive global scale yet, fortunately, but still wars that could, could actually develop into something more serious. So what do you see there on that side, Matt, uh, on the, with the wars and the risks uh, of that escalating to something worse? Yeah, you know, what immediately comes to mind is a quote you and I have both used many times, and you know, it's from Ernest Hemingway, not Ben Bernanke. And he wrote this, this is a man who has experienced in two world wars, and he said, Whenever you get a country debt soaked and desperate, uh, you get political opportunists, political opportunists who take the country to temporary prosperity through debasing the currency and inflation and then permanent ruin through war. And, uh, you know, what do we have? Debased currency, inflation and constant war. Uh, since I was born in the 70s, right around the time Nixon decoupled from the dollar and we lost that chaperone and debt went from, like you said, to incredible levels. Uh, you know, my country's been at war pretty much everywhere. And I've always said, uh, this is not disparaging the soldiers, it's disparaging the statesmen, the donkeys who lead these lions into, into wars from Vietnam to Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, basically, obviously, a, a proxy war in Ukraine, and now unknown and, developments. And, and Libya, in the Middle of course. East. And, and Libya, and, of course. And Libya, Libya yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So... It's been a, a string side of failed wars, no matter how you look at it, not failed soldiers, but failed policies and really not a spreading of democracy and freedom. But the most recent headlines, of course, now are wars in the Middle East, the perennial problem in the Muslim and Israel and the Muslim world around it. 
We had the Abraham Accords not too long ago uh, in 2020, where Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates uh, recognized Israel as a sovereign state and created embassies, et cetera. And that was a positive moment that that seems to have lost now since October 7th. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, October 7th was an appalling event at an intimate, violent level. Uh, the reaction was swift and immediate, as expected. Uh, yeah. It has led to a great deal of controversy. You know, this is a geopolitical, cultural, historical, and religious mess in a blender for which you and I will not have the final answer. But it is extremely complex and sensitive. I think we all agree what happened on October 7th was appalling. And those images created a reaction, though. Uh, Netanyahu, who has an ideological and political need to be very hawkish and he's supported by many, uh, the countermeasures, uh, you could say, were disproportionate or not. Um, you could say that's like trying to swat a kitchen going after Hamas. It's like swatting a fly in the kitchen with a cannonball. You're going to break the oven, the stove, and the walls. Um, we've had disproportionate responses, you could say, in Osaka or Tokyo or Nagasaki or, you know, Hamburg or, break, you know, uh, Berlin or other cities in Germany during the war. So what's a disproportionate response? You, again, very debatable. We're not going to answer that. Iran, though, has desperate mullahs who are running out of power. They want to see a disproportionate response from Israel because that creates public sympathy for the, the Islamic cause. And so in a lot of ways, like it or not, this is kind of the reaction they were expecting. Um, they're hoping for a massive response. Again, Netanyahu and his you know, kind of coalition government is falling into that play. It's understandable, but the, 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 the emotions are high. I think the real issue though, isn't you and I trying to solve the Arab-Israeli crisis on a, in, a, in a podcast or a conversation. The real issue is escalation risk from Hamas to Hezbollah. Wars can be debated, and legitimately so, but as I've said in other interviews, wars also come down to dollars and cents and U.S. treasuries and support and debt and more and more of the same. And, you know, uh, we may not have to send soldiers right away, but if things escalate as expected, as potentially possible in the Middle East, uh, U.S. support but, but, but for Matt, Israel is Matt, pretty much assured. Just one point here, Matt. Because you have mm -hmm. war on a major scale, and, and these wars, in Ukraine is a major scale, although it's not global, mm -hmm. but it's major scale. Yep. But in the Middle East, it's not a war on the major scale yet. And, and it, nobody mm -hmm. knows, as you said, with, with Iran um, getting involved. And of course, Russia is on, on Iran's side, and, and China mm -hmm. will be more on Iran's side than, than on the US side. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, as I see, the, the real risk the, um, is not a war developing to a global war based on what's happening in, in, at this point in, in Israel mm -hmm. or, 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 or in the Palestine. The real risk is here uh, a war on, on, on uh, <laughs> a guerrilla type war where, where you mm -hmm. have where you have you know, a, a Muslim or a Arab war against the West, which, as we know, can effectively be uh, carried out without many weapons at all. It's just a few men and, mm -hmm. and, and, and a few dirty bombs. Or, or And if you put them mm -hmm. in the right places, whether it's in, in U.S. shopping centers or in U.S. major buildings or, or, or in, in London mm -hmm. or, or in Berlin or whatever, that could just that is just enough to paralyze the world, and, and, and uh, you know these the these groups that you mentioned um, and obviously supported by Iran, I mean they are very capable of carrying out uh, the, these kind of, kind of of attacks around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, from, from shopping malls in the U.S. to subway stations in Paris in the '80s, we remember these when the Intifada, the first one and the second again. It's impossible for us to really project how and where and to what extent this escalates. To your point, I hope it's not a global war, but it will be a more of a guerrilla, messy war. Either way, it will be expensive, just like Iraq, just like Syria, just like Libya. God knows Afghanistan was very expensive and it was a disastrous policy for us in the world, but certainly for the U.S. And again, these are terrifying thoughts in net financially, which is a drier topic whether we're directly or indirectly involved in these wars, that's going to increase our debt levels significantly, like Afghanistan did. And so the U.S. 
we'll have to issue far more treasuries that are otherwise unwanted by the rest of the world, which means that, let's be honest, the buyers of those treasuries are not European or Eastern, Eastern central banks in particular. It's going to be the U.S. Fed, which means, to Hemingway's point, more debased money to pay for our constant war policy in the U.S. since 1971. And that does affect the gold price. Everything comes back to gold. And the many themes we're going to talk about over the next few months, it still comes back to gold, not because we want it to, but because it does, just like uh, cryptocurrencies, another major important yeah. topic. So what you're saying is, which, uh, and, and I agree with that, is uh, nobody knows how these uh, wars will evolve. Uh, Ukraine is on a bigger scale, as we said, uh, uh, and Palestine, I would say, is almost... Uh, more dangerous than, than, than the Ukraine war at this stage. At this stage, we have to yeah. add. But uh, so we don't know. What we do know, uh, as you rightly say, is that in whatever way they develop, it'll cost more money. There'll be the whole world is arming. You know, the weapons industry is working around the clock, uh, reducing arms, uh, bullets, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so and all of that will be at a cost to, to the world. You know, mm -hmm. just. Think about now what's happening with with the NATO membership. In, in Finland is already a member. Um, Sweden is trying desperately to become a member. Uh, you know, I was born in Sweden. I have dual citizenship, mm -hmm. Swedish and Swiss. But mm -hmm. you know, the, my Swedish heart says that it's totally ridiculous to, for Sweden to join NATO because you're just escalating everything. Okay, because it means now with first Finland and then Sweden. It means that Finland, uh, the US, this, sorry, the, the Russia has to put more and more troops along the borders now to Finland, um, and then they have to put more and more uh, ships into the Baltic. Um, mm -hmm. So you know you're just escalating the whole war now, and that means that that, that America and the West and Sweden and Finland and everybody else needs to arm too. Uh, and you're looking mm -hmm. now at defense costs going up. If not yet mm -hmm. uh, exponentially, they will do because every just uh, everybody's just arming uh, the, the, the country mm -hmm. uh, to an extent that is is really because of, as I said, NATO membership is, is certainly mm -hmm. all of NATO is surrounding Ukraine and and and, uh, and Russia mm -hmm. therefore, uh, and Russia doesn't like that. So we are escalating the war, and that's inevitable. So sadly, the, the beneficiaries will be the the. the the, the the defense industry to a great extent yeah and the world Badly. will be much worse off for it so yeah. uh but anyway so you told so that that that's the so we don't know what's going to happen we know that's it'll be costly that's what we're saying and we know that mm -hmm. it'll affect debt and we know therefore that again it will have an effect on the value of money and therefore an mm -hmm. effect on on the gold price which all it does is reflect the debasement of of, of money yeah but you started asking about crypto uh, also, or talking mm -hmm. about crypto, uh, Matt. Yeah, I think it's another important topic. I mean, your point about NATO is fascinating. It reminds me of the guns of August of 1914. An assassination in Sarajevo leads to an alliance, to an alliance, a domino fall. Uh, Germany invades Poland in 1939. France declares war on Germany. England, you know, it just it, these domino effects, these NATO expansions are making things worse. And, you know, the beneficiaries are the, the military industrial complex and those who are funded by it. And then the, the currency is always crushed in the meantime. And when we talk about currency destruction, of course, we talk about gold, but crypto is another theme. And, uh, you know, we can begin with your thoughts broadly on crypto, Egon, and that usually now means a conversation on Bitcoin, um, you know, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts. I'll throw in mine. We don't have to be anti-crypto to be pro-gold. I think they're very, very different asset classes, but I'll let you start with that. Yes. Well, we've always had a strong view about cryptos. And, and I, I'm still, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I think it's wonderful. The people who got into uh, Bitcoin early and, and mm -hmm. made a lot of money uh, and, and, you know, good on them. I mean, it, it is an incredibly interesting speculative instrument. We don't think that crypto is wealth preservation uh, mm -hmm. in, in the same form as, as gold is. Um, it mm -hmm. certainly can act as money until central banks um, clamp down on it. Uh, and and uh, so far they haven't, but if of course anything that becomes too big and interferes with their, with their financial system, they will mm -hmm. stop. 
So, so yeah. in my view, Bitcoin or other, other cryptocurrencies will never be allowed to become big. That doesn't mean mm. that, you know, Bitcoin, for example, can't go to a, a million dollars before this happens. You know, right. It's not a forecast, but I haven't got a clue. Uh, but it could easily happen because, you, you know, you're just, you're just seeing uh, how it moves. I mean, it moved, you know, you know the, it, it, it went up to $65,000. It went on to $16,000. Um, and in the last mm. few months, it's gone up to, you know, for, well, we're near, what, $45,000. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that can never be a currency, of course, and gold is never that volatile. Gold moves right. in much longer cycles um, and is much more stable as an alternative currency. But as a method of mm -hmm. payment, as long as governments don't stop it, and as long as you know people accept Bitcoin, of course, it's a wonderful instrument, um, as mm -hmm. long as you have electricity and, and computers working. Uh, you know that's also so if you if you're on an island yeah. somewhere that won't that won't be the case. Um, yeah. Or if you or if, but but you know I, yes. So, so Bitcoin can easily uh, go to a million dollars because spec of speculation. Uh, but it's in my view, if governments start clamping down on it and say, well, now you it's too you're too big for your boots, so Bitcoin, you know, mm -hmm. you can go to zero also. So, so mm -hmm. um, you know, in our view, we are not looking at Bitcoin from a point of view of wealth preservation. Uh, it doesn't mean that people shouldn't continue to speculate in it, or maybe some people also hold hold it um, as an emergency currency, bearing in mind that the risk uh, is considerably higher than for gold. You know, the, the, you know, the, the wonderful thing about gold is that it has been money for, let's say, 5,000 years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and you, uh, something that has a history of 15 years, let, let's say, um, you could never say that that will replace uh, gold. Um, the, 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 we don't know what's going to happen to, to uh, Bitcoin. Or It's more likely that governments, of course, will try to evolve their, their digital currencies um, uh, and use that as, to control the people. Yeah. I think, I think, I hope, and I think, in the end, that when that, that you know that leads to a totalitarian state in the end, and we know what happens mm -hmm. to totalitarian states uh, when they they mm -hmm. fail, uh, but they, yeah. they can work work for for a for a certain period. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I um, mean, you know, the what what is your view about uh, you know Bitcoin and and and, the, uh, and the cryptocurrencies, Matt? Uh, yeah, I mean, broadly, you, know, you should mention also, for perhaps, you know, of course, the, the SEC has made a very important decision now, uh, which yeah. uh, makes a difference. Yeah, no, it's it's all related. I mean, broadly, again, you know, we know friends like uh, Ronnie Sturfalo, who run funds, or Larry Leopard, who run funds, who speculate in crypto. Um, you know, again, we don't have to be anti-crypto to be pro-gold or mock crypto investors like Others in our industry, like Jim Rickards or Peter Schiff, do, and they have very strong opinions and they're respectable opinions. Again, I think we're comparing apples to oranges. There is a narrative in the crypto space, which we all share in the gold space, of looking for a decentralized alternative currency to fiat money, something outside of the fiat system, outside of the banking system. A lot of crypto evangelicals, you know, pound their fist on that. My experience with them is they're primarily speculators, although they use the gold narrative, similar gold narrative. Uh, to your point on price movements, you know, in August of 2020, crypto was at 12,000. November 2021 is at 67,000. Today it's at 44,000. Those kind of moves do not suggest to me an alternative currency or a store of value. Defenders of Bitcoin would say it's a consolidation phase and that'll come. And again, gold will succeed either way. So we don't have to mock or castigate crypto investors. But I think the evidence speaks for itself that crypto is a speculative asset, not an alternative currency despite central banks like El Salvador adopting it. You could argue that'll happen, but central banks in the East are collecting gold at record levels, not crypto. You know, sophisticated developed economies are stacking gold, not crypto. Again, it doesn't mean crypto is a joke. There's been headlines recently about crypto. Obviously, Binance had a massive multi-billion dollar lawsuit for not following anti-money laundering and KYC rules. And of course, you had Sam Bankman freed with the FTX disaster. Those were human failures, not blockchain failures. And I don't think it's a direct threat. Some could say it's helping the Bitcoin industry uh, can get more clean. What I find interesting on the human side, including the SEC, the human side of Bitcoin, which is making headlines, 
You had Larry Fink, who's a human, all too human individual by every stretch of the imagination. I don't know where our antitrust laws in America went, but BlackRock in 2017 was openly mocking Bitcoin as just a money laundering tool. Now, Larry Fink and BlackRock are going to do a spot ETF, which the SEC is going to regulate. And, uh, you know, Larry Fink wants to buy four of the five largest Bitcoin miners. So he sees a financial speculation opportunity. He has no worldview. He sees an opportunity because he's a speculator. And I think, you know, whether that's good or bad for Bitcoin, it takes away its decentralized theme when you have a BlackRock ETF. And depending on the market cap of that ETF, you know, it's it's is a lot to be said about the future of Bitcoin. And again, God bless those that have made money. We, you and I both know a lot of people who come to us in Switzerland who made money in Bitcoin as a speculation asset who then want to convert it to gold as a preservation asset. So let's just call a duck a duck. I think right now Bitcoin is a fantastic opportunity. Some call it a tulip. I certainly made money on dot-com bubbles assets. Don't regret it, but that was a speculation play. Now I'm in a wealth preservation mode. They're very different mentalities. I think gold will be both a preservation and a speculation asset in the coming years because of all the rivers that re lead towards gold. But I think, you know, again, I'll close with, you know, there's been alchemy throughout history, people trying to find ways, metallurgists, philosophers, thinkers, trying to find ways to come up with a new gold with different metals and different alloys. It never worked. Many could argue that Bitcoin is another attempt to make something out of nothing into gold. I don't yeah. think it's gold. But, and I think, the key thing in terms of a true stable store of value and a future preservation asset, there is a reason central banks and sophisticated wealth preservation asset investors are buying physical gold, not crypto. Crypto is a fantastic trade mechanism. So that's my view. It's not to mock crypto investors, you know, wish them the best. And that kind of volatility, we'll put up a chart, just the volatility comparing gold to Bitcoin. It stands for itself. It just oh, does. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, so wait, yeah. Well, so Matt, we we have talked about now the the uh, well, some of the the, the risks related to uh, uh, gold, and of course, war was the first one, and, and that is a, mm -hmm. a major risk area. And the second one, crypto is is very much related to gold. Some people say, see it as the same, and for the reasons we have explained, we don't quite see mm -hmm. that. Uh, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we dismiss Bitcoin, but we're we're specializing yeah. in wealth preservation, and therefore, uh, we don't see Bitcoin being part of that. So these were, um, Matt, the, the first uh, the two uh, subjects that, that we were uh, going to talk about, you and I, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, this, in this series. And, and really, it, 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 we are trying to inform people about now the, the urgency of making a, a more... Uh, decisive choice in in protecting your assets uh, than sticking to your. Uh, we know that a lot of our uh, viewers and, and 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 of course clients are all in into gold, but we know that the rest of the world is not so as because as I said, ninety nine and a half percent of world financial assets right. are not invested in gold, and we're going to see an era now when that will be a, a made you switch into safe assets. Uh, but that won't happen until stock markets crash or and 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 or certainly come down dramatically, uh, and uh, and sadly uh, for investors who want to protect themselves, we see that gold could easily start moving soon. Uh, we and I always make the point that forecasting short term is a mug's game. Over yeah. over time, we know that gold always goes up against uh, debased currencies. And we think mm -hmm. we are, you know, gold has been holding now, Matt, um, at, the, at the highs, you know, mm -hmm. at over $2,000 for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we think that uh, it's the next move is probably not mm -hmm. far away. And once it does break out over, you know, these technical area levels of over 2,100, sure. gold could move very fast. So, you know, this is the time now to think about protection because, you don't want to be left behind here, but you know no. this is a lot. At the same time, it's going to be a, a, a very long uh, move here you know, of gold, uh, and of mm -hmm. course, so we are going to talk about in the future the reasons for that. Obviously, the BRIC countries come into this um, mm -hmm. and, and the move away from from financial assets to uh, commodity based mm -hmm. assets, and, and the move from mm -hmm. from the west um, to to the uh, east and and, and south. Um, and that, these are going to be 
again, seminal moves in the world yeah. that nobody realizes at this point. But you know, just remember yeah. Russia that that the West uh, uh, tries to to uh, well do, do everything to to san sanction and, and exclude out of the world trade. Um, yeah. That you know, Russia has eighty five trillion dollars worth of resources in the ground. You know, yeah. that cannot be dismissed in the long term. Russia is going yeah. to be a major resource country. Um, uh, and once they can also refine their resources rather than to, to, to sell them just for the, for the price of, of the raw material, um, they could easily be together with China a major yeah. economy. So there's a lot of movement taking place here. I don't know. People are not aware of that. Everybody is still hoping for the stock market to go to the sky, which it already has. Nobody realizes that. Is already in the sky, um, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know. So, so I, I think sadly, a, a, a lot of events will be on the negative side of, of all these bubble markets. Anyway, these are some of the areas we will talk about. We'll talk about gold, of course, and how to hold gold and how to uh, in the best jurisdictions, the best best uh, vaults and the best mm -hmm. form, etc. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and I, we think that this is now very timely. So. We, we yeah. welcome, welcome uh, viewers to, to come back to us again. And we're, we're mm -hmm. going to try to have one of these chats uh, once a week. Yeah, no, and again, Egan, I think we've hit we've hit some important themes today on geopolitics, war, and the crypto space. But to your point, we've got de-dollarization, we've got oil, we've got currencies, we've got markets. And I want to say one thing, because I think you're being too modest. It is a mugs game to predict the gold's price movement. But let's not forget... It has been a steady rise since you formed your enterprise decades ago at the turn of the century. You were buying gold at $300 an ounce. It's gone significantly higher than that in the lifetime of this enterprise and in your investing career. It hasn't been a mugs game. You've been correct. It's been a steady rise in the gold price because there's been a steady demise in currency, in fiat currencies. So 300 to 2000 isn't so bad, uh, Egon. And Again, it doesn't have to double tomorrow like Bitcoin to be a sound, sound preservation asset. Don't forget that. No, absolutely right. And remember, people say, well, he's lucky he bought, you know, they bought gold at 300. But, you know, I think measured against money supply, measured against debt, measuring against the risk in the world, gold at 300 at the time was more expensive than gold is at 2000 in my opinion. Right. So don't think that exactly. you missed the boat. You know, the boat is just hasn't mm -hmm. left uh, the port yet. Um, yeah. so, so, yeah. so, so, you know, that, there's a long way to go. And now is the time before the massive switch in assets take yeah. place. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, the switch in wealth takes place uh, and the distraction of wealth takes place for a lot of people who are all in all of these bubble assets. Now is the time to think about yeah. protecting some of that. So, yeah. again, anyway, that's what we will talk about in, in, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, so um, thank you for this time, everybody and Matt. And, and uh, yeah. we'll see you soon again. Bye-bye. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye.